Welcome to Health Focus, where we focus on your health. Today we're going to focus on a very important topic. I'm Dr. Scott Anderson, and we're here to focus on fentanyl. Now, fentanyl is an analgesic or pain-killing medication that's also used for anesthesia. And when used properly, it could really be a blessing to many people in a medical sense in that it can alleviate pain and help induce anesthesia for medical procedures. Unfortunately, it also has caused untold pain and suffering when it comes to fentanyl that is smuggled into the country, manufactured illegally or diverted in a manner that can result in overdoses. And today we're very fortunate to have with us an activist and volunteer who knows a lot about this. Michelle Leopold, welcome to Health Focus. Thanks, Dr. Scott. Now, I know that this is a subject that you came to through some experiences with your family, and uh, it's not something you've spent your whole life addressing, right? You also have a career and other interests. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved in this subject. Sure, well, sadly, my forever 18-year-old son died from fentanyl poisoning two and a half years ago this week, actually. And from the day that we found out that he died, and when I spoke with the coroner, I said, it sounds like it's most likely fentanyl. And he said, well, we won't know for sure for about two months, but that would be my guess as well. And so from that day, my husband and I said, we can't lie about it. We can't hide it, sweep it under the rug. Let's be honest. So from day one, we've been sharing that Trevor's death was fentanyl poisoning, and I am doing what other moms want to do to protect kids and protect, protect our families. And so I'm trying to spread the word and learning really fast, and the information's changing uh, literally every couple of weeks. But I'm now a unofficial expert. I can't tell you how saddened I am by your loss. I mean, this is every parent's worst nightmare. And I think we discussed that we have uh, had children that are about the same age, and this can strike any family. It doesn't have to be a family where you have children or adolescents who have a history of uh, drug use. It could strike any family, isn't that right? Right, and it's not a parenting situation also. Today's illicit fentanyl is what I especially have been noticing that it is killing so many young adults um, and older adults too who don't realize that the fentanyl, illicit fentanyl, is being manufactured and included in almost every single street drug that's out there from pressed pills to even cocaine and people think they're just using cocaine or having an Xanax and they don't realize that there's a lethal dose of fentanyl in there. So some of our viewers may not be too familiar with fentanyl, so let's talk a little bit about it in general terms. Uh, fentanyl is an opioid, and it's a synthetic opioid. So we have natural opioids like morphine derived from a poppy in Central Asia, perhaps. We have some semi-synthetic uh, variations of morphine like oxycodone that have been altered in a chemistry laboratory. Uh, fentanyl, it's also related to morphine because it's a, in the class of opioids that are the most powerful pain-killing uh, medications we have, but it's fully synthetic. It's created in laboratories. So getting back to your activism and your volunteerism, uh, this isn't something that we necessarily can stop the production of as long as there are laboratories producing it. Would you agree with that? I absolutely agree, and there's a lot of tentacles to this horrific yeah. octopus of a problem, and the stopping it from getting into the country. I'm grateful for all that the DEA is doing to right. take drugs out of circulation, but it's here, and if yeah. the drug dealers want more fentanyl, they just have to put on a night shift. It's not like opium poppies or cocoa leaves to make cocaine or marijuana where you have to actually grow a whole plant. This is just chemicals that you can make a huge batch to kill thousands of millions of people in one evening. Right, tremendously potent in terms of the amount needed. And just to be clear, in case my previous comments were misconstrued, I, I think that 
uh, the efforts at interdiction at stopping drugs from entering the country are in fact critical because the more fentanyl is out there, you know, even any amount of fentanyl out there has the potential to harm people right. and we have to really do everything we can to keep it out of our country. But yet I think the point we, we're, we're both expressing is that um, it's probably going to be there no matter what. And so education, that's why what you do in education is so important. And I must say, I'm moved by the fact that you've experienced this terrible tragedy, and yet you're turning it into something positive. Thanks. And before we get into that a little bit more, uh, I don't want to dwell on it too much because we're trying to talk about the future, but uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about Trevor. Thanks. If you feel comfortable. Sure. So Trevor was a wonderful, loving human being. Um, he loved nature. Yeah. Um, his spirit animal was a goat. Uh, he always found heart-shaped rocks when we would go hiking. And um, then in his freshman year of high school, he discovered drugs. Um, and I did all I could to learn about them and to, you know, we did all the right things uh, to try and raise good children, um, but it wasn't anything that I had control over. The things that we did have control over, for instance, uh, taking him out of the school setting and sending him elsewhere to learn ways to stop using drugs, we did until he turned 18. Um, after he turned 18, he was an adult and he could make up his own decisions. Mm -hmm and he chose to continue using. He wasn't an addict. He wasn't on the streets of the Tenderloin. He was going to Sonoma State University. Um, but unfortunately, that weekend, he had bought some Blue 30s, oxycodone, um, which I understand are now called Dirty 30s because they stopped making Blue 30s several years ago. And so every single blue pill that's stamped M30 has most likely a an amount of fentanyl in it, if not a lethal amount of fentanyl, if you are, if you haven't been using it on a regular basis. So, I could see the pain in your face as you discuss this. I'm, I'm also reminded of previous shows we've done on this general topic. Uh, we did one about three years ago with Dr. Dennis Hawley on the opioid crisis, and he was warning at that time that uh, the overdose rate had increased to as many as 50,000 deaths a year. Dr. Holly is an internist and a, a researcher and a fine clinician. And um, I was talking to him off air earlier today in preparation for the show. And of course, the news now is that the overdose rate in the U.S. has uh, gone up to about 106,000 or more a year, and it may be underreported. Exactly. And fentanyl, um, getting back to to Trevor to some extent, um, it could sneak up on people who aren't expecting it, right? Because you could be using other drugs that are not likely to cause an overdose. We just did a show a, week, a month ago, for example, on marijuana with uh, our mutual friend Bart Bright. And um, high THC marijuana could lead to problems including psychosis that could in turn lead to suicide or vehicular accidents. But when we're talking about fentanyl, it's uh, a whole different situation. It's the kind of thing where on a first use experience, a person taking a pill that's laced with fentanyl could uh, die of uh, respiratory arrest. So it's a horrible thing to contemplate. And I hear you saying Trevor was using some other drugs. Um, Mask was using marijuana, for example. High potency THC was his drug of choice. Okay, so high potency yes. THC. And how did that lead to fentanyl? Was it through a one-time experience or repeated use and just getting a so-called hot dose or something? I don't believe he was trying fentanyl. I believe he was wanting to know what oxycodone was like. Okay, so this was purely a case of lacing another drug. That is my understanding. I don't have any reason to think that, right. and all of his friends agree he was not looking to kill himself. Oh, you know, I... I certainly take you at your word for that. Um, but I, wouldn't you agree it makes the point of how dangerous fentanyl is? It is, and it's just a couple of grains of fentanyl that makes the difference between life and death. It's so 
compacted the power of just a little grain of fentanyl um, is enough to give a huge high, 100 times more than morphine. Right. And two grains can be the difference between life and death in somebody that doesn't have the tolerance for fentanyl. There are people now that are addicted to fentanyl, especially in San Francisco's Tenderloin, for instance. I have friends that are at the Capitol building right now um, telling Gavin Newsom we have to do something about the fentanyl crisis in California because it's across the entire states, across the entire country. And uh, we need to do more. I've been doing this for two and a half years and more needs to be done. It can't be all by parents, so thank you for having me on. Oh, no, thank you for coming. That's what we're trying to do. And I, I must say, in the interest of just full disclosure of you know what I do as a physician, that although I've always been very cautious about prescribing narcotics, uh, I think there's a pendulum to the way narcotics are dispersed by the medical profession. And beginning in the 1990s, and we discussed this on our previous show, on opioids, uh, there was pressure on doctors to prescribe more generously, that is to say in higher dosages, with greater frequency narcotics for chronic pain. It was felt to be the so-called fifth vital sign and uh, doctors began to prescribe more. And if you consider now, it's estimated that there are uh, 100 million people in the U.S. that have chronic pain and over 300 million prescriptions for narcotics per year. That's something that I, I read that I think is in the ballpark. I believe that the U.S. accounts for 80% of the prescriptions of uh, narcotics in the world. And the reason I mention that is it used to be that a minority of individuals who got into opioid-related drugs, uh, had a minority had a history of a medical problem. But some have estimated that now it's changed that up to two-thirds of people using opioid drugs may have initially gotten into the use of opioid drugs through being prescribed medications for pain for a sprained ankle or a bad back or a chronic problem and uh, then dealing with a secondary habituation giving rise to an addiction. Um, so you're educating the public about how dangerous this drug is. Um, and as I said, it does have its legitimate use, but what do, you, what do you think is leading us down this pathway where we're seeing so much more of the way of problems with this? I think part of it is the way that the fentanyl is being manufactured. Um, it has moved to Mexico. If you, um, the, the book I recommend to learn more about this is Sam Quinone's The Least of Us, where he talks about the, it was just released in November, so it's very current about manufacturing both fentanyl and um, meth in Mexico now that um, China has closed their doors to fentanyl manufacturing. So they get the precursors from China, they make it in Mexico, but there is no lab like Purdue, for instance, right. pressing pills. They're just using pill presses that they buy off the internet or the black market. And there's no dosing of the amount of fentanyl. As a doctor, you know how it's very important to get the exact right dose when you are using fentanyl, for instance, in a surgery procedure. And you can reverse it with uh, um, Narcan or right. Naloxone. Uh, which is the beauty of fentanyl, which it can be reversed, but there is no perfect measurement in these drugs that they're sending, whether it's cocaine or pills or anything else. And a lot of the uh, cheapness of making fentanyl, because there, it doesn't cost very much and they have such a big supply, so they drop the price, it's getting more and more people addicted and not all of them were addicted to anything before. And they tried a couple of times and they're like, oh my gosh, this is a higher high than I've ever had. And that dope sickness also really affects people and they don't wanna feel that and maybe they get more. And the next thing you know, they're addicted. And I've heard these stories mm -hmm. countless times from friends whose kids are either currently in addiction or sadly who have died. I'm glad you mentioned uh, Sam Canonis and The Least of Us. Uh, although I haven't read the book, I heard an interview with him in detail on, I believe, public radio. So I'm familiar with his work. It's, it sounds really superb, and uh, it sounds like he's done a remarkable job. 
maybe someday we'll interview him here, but I believe one of the things he mentioned in the interview was the whole issue of potency. And he talked a lot, I believe, about methamphetamine also. Mm -hmm. And that basically, and this seems to be a trend. I mean, uh, marijuana back in the 70s, uh, Bart Brightis told us three to 5% THC. Now it gets up to 70 to 90%. I think uh, Sam Canonas said something comparable, if I'm not mistaken, about meth. That, the, the, it's no longer a party drug. It's it no used, longer a party drug. Yeah, it used to be made with the epinephrine, I believe, uh, that was soup right. fed. And now the uh, analog that they're making it doesn't cause that same high. It causes a very uh, psychotic right. feeling, and you want to hide in your tent, and which is perfect for some of our homeless right. populations. And then we're talking about a similar thing with the potency issues with illicit drugs in the form of fentanyl. So I'm thinking probably this conversation, instead of focusing only on fentanyl, really has to recognize that there's a broader problem of what one might call you know, addiction in general or polysubstance abuse. And this is just one part of the puzzle, but it happens to be the part that's killing the most people. Exactly. So as we move forward with this discussion, I'll just cut to the chase on what we really want to talk about. How can we do better? So Michelle Leopold, as a volunteer, as an activist, what do you think we should be doing better to fight this fentanyl crisis? First of all, I need people to know about fentanyl. Sadly, I know a lot of parents whose children have died from fentanyl poisoning, and so many of them have said, I hadn't even heard the word fentanyl before my child died from fentanyl. So number one, we still need awareness. Uh, gratefully, a whole bunch of different organizations got together this past Tuesday, May 10th, and they did the first ever National Fentanyl Awareness Day. And of course, I saw it everywhere because I w was looking for it, uh, but I'm hoping that people that had never heard about fentanyl became aware of it on Tuesday and in the subsequent efforts that the organization is doing. Because people need to know that it is in almost all drugs these days, and that one pill can kill. Uh, when I first started being an activist, the DEA was reporting one out of four pills that they were confiscating had a lethal dose of fentanyl in it, and now it's two out of five. And I liken that to Russian roulette, but the odds are way in your favor for a Russian roulette because it's only one bullet out of six holes in a gun. Right. And this we're talking about, you have a two out of five chance of dying from one pill. That's terrifying, and it's particularly terrifying for our youth. Right. Because, I mean, I think, I can certainly say that, I know that I did things when I was in my teens or 20s that in retrospect I would not have done. And there's a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex that inhibits us from doing things like driving too fast in the rain or getting in a fight or whatever. And that part of the brain doesn't develop until at least the mid-20s. Uh, I shouldn't say it doesn't develop. It doesn't reach its fully mature <laughs> potential till the mid-20s. Some have even said the late 20s in men. Especially if you're male, I yes. understand. <laughs> and, and, and in women, uh, you know, perhaps a little earlier. But still, uh, you know, most of us make a few mistakes. But this is, we're talking about one pill. Mm -mm. That means you make one mistake you take one pill and it could end your life. Uh, we have to get the word out on this. Right. I it, often say that yeah. kids should learn from their experiments instead of die from them. And we used to say, just say no. We know that that experiment didn't work. So now we need to say, just say K-N-O-W. And you need to know that these are the chances that you're taking when you buy a, a pill off Snapchat. And I do have some recommendations if you'd like me to share. Sure, going in, in just a moment, but uh, I want to follow up on uh, just say no. Um, you know, obviously that was popularized by Nancy Reagan, and I, I understand you take a somewhat negative view of it. Do you think it did any good at all? It did for me, but uh, there were a lot of people that thought it was a joke. Because. Um, I don't know of data one way or the other on that particular approach or the approach of D.A.R.E., which I think grew out of it, if I'm not mistaken. But my feeling is sometimes these programs are not fully effective, but they still do some good. 
Mm -hmm. I, I don't know for a fact with respect to that one. But talk about the things we could do. You mentioned uh, one pill can kill. So do we convey that message as parents, as community activists, as teachers, or do we do it through all of these modalities? What do you, what all do you think? All of this. Do you think and we're making an effort now? Are we doing anywhere near enough? No, we're not doing enough. Okay. Uh, for instance, in so I'm from Marin County currently, right. and we have had several young men die from fentanyl poisoning recently. And so we said, well, let's look at what they're teaching. What's the curriculum in our schools? Right. And even though we had all these fentanyl deaths, they never mentioned fentanyl in the curriculum. So that's an obvious place to start. Well said. I, I was, as I say, talking to a previous guest, Dr. Holly, about our show today. And one of the things that he suggested that I broach as a subject, or he mentioned to me, is the importance of peer educators. Yes. And, you know, Dennis and I worked together in prison and often for, we were doctors in the correctional system and uh, often there were peer educators who served as counselors. And of course, peer educators speak the language of the person they're talking to. For example, the last time I had a discussed fentanyl, uh, it was mentioned to me that it's called China White. China White. I don't know, is that true? I have no idea. Has the name changed? I don't know. But that's where a peer educator can really reach out and make a difference. Do we have peer educators for high school students or college students who could help in this battle? Not enough. We need everything. We need all hands on deck. Okay. We need every single possible tool to be deployed. Um, awareness is one thing. Narcan, naloxone, that to me is a very important thing. Um, just to share with the audience, uh, naloxone reverses opioid overdoses. It's what doctors can use in a surgery situation to stop the opioid from working. Absolutely, and in fact, uh, my, my son Luke, who's uh, an emergency medical technician, he and I were discussing this earlier today too, and um, he told me that they are in fact trained to use naloxone He's in Washington, D.C., and, and we'll be working on an ambulance this summer in, at Georgetown University in the surrounding area, and uh, they're, they're trained to use naloxone. And the thing about naloxone, too, are, is that it can be administered intravenously, I believe, but it could also, because it's used by anesthesiologists, it, I think it can also be given nasally. Narcan and, is the nasal application, right. and I was just at a conference two weeks ago in Atlanta where they were introducing a uh, EpiPen sort of injection into right. the leg with a higher dose of naloxone in order to reverse the fentanyl specifically because right. Narcan wasn't created with fentanyl in mind. It was created with a lower dose of opiates. Right, and so one of the things, and you and I have discussed this, so we we'll, might as well get into it, is you know, this could be administered by anyone. Mm -hmm. So I think you suggested perhaps it should be, I think you used the term on every street corner but, or something like that, certainly in some areas perhaps. Can you tell us what you think? Sure, so for instance, across the bridge, if you go to the jail in San Rafael, right. uh, go to the second floor, we have a vending machine and you can get a free box of Narcan right. at the vending machine. Um, there's no stigma in having Narcan or Naloxone because you can't inject yourself, you can't apply it for yourself. You can only help save a life. You can't save your own because you'll be too far gone. So there's no stigma in having Narcan and it should be in everybody's first aid kit now and it should be you know, anywhere where there might be a party situation. Mm -hmm even grown-ups um, mm -hmm. if they are using illicit drugs. Absolutely, grown-ups, um, yeah. And there are lots of adults dying also from one-time use, whether it's in cocaine or right. a pill that they bought that they thought was safe. Right, you know, uh, when I was in medical school, we used to have protocols for reviving someone who's unconscious, and among other things, giving glucose intravenously was important because if somebody is in a diabetic coma, uh, it could save their life. 
Uh, naloxone certainly was on the list of things that could be given. But I think the thought in general was to give it if you have an index of suspicion. I think maybe it should be given uh, a bit more liberally. And it may well be that the guidelines have changed. I don't track this every day by any means. But the worst thing that can happen with naloxone is that you put somebody into narcotic withdrawal and they feel really miserable. But you're not going to kill somebody with it. If you had naloxone me right now, nothing right. would happen. All right. There is zero uh, issue uh, in giving somebody that doesn't have any opiates in their system uh, naloxone. Right. So that's really important to know. And the Good Samaritan laws is mm -hmm. another thing that everybody should know about, that there is no harm in calling 911 if you're suspecting somebody is right. overdosing. Um, I. All 50 states now have Good Samaritan laws. They vary. Uh, Google what your state is. Um, but then going back to naloxone, almost all right. CVS will give uh, naloxone with a prescription. So you can just ask a doctor for a prescription if you think you might need it. Right. And then a lot of the, I, there's a place in Solano County that is giving away naloxone too. I'm not familiar, right. um, but just Google free Narcan near me. Uh, Michelle Leopold, I could go on discussing this with you for so long, and we hardly touched the subject of uh, high THC marijuana, but we did focus a lot on fentanyl. And again, the slogan is, one pill can kill. No random drugs. No random drugs. I want to extend my condolences for the loss of your son, and also say that I think it's wonderful that you've taken this tragedy and turned it into something so positive. Thank you for joining us, and in the future, I hope that we'll make progress in this battle to overcome fentanyl and fentanyl overdosing, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much for being with us. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks.